Eugene Peterson, in his introduction, writes this. Our life day to day is a pilgrimage. We are traveling toward God. We are not merely trying to survive or even simply to do the best we can. That is what it means to be Christian, to be human. Indeed, we are on a pilgrimage together, ever traveling towards God. And today our journey is taking us in a slightly new direction as we offer to you the weekly sermon and some accompanying devotional aids. You may notice the feel of the Sunday morning worship experience is missing as we won't be having hymns or some of the lit liturgy that we had during the COVID-19 shutdown and the months that followed. I trust that this new format that we are trying in this new season of our life together will not adversely affect your time of worshiping God. Part of the reason for this change is the hope that this devotional experience will tie into my Doctor of Ministry project, which includes the weekly sermon and an accompanying daily devotional. If you'd like to receive the devotional, please contact the church office. They are available on the website, via email and snail mail. If you have any suggestions or ideas on how tweaking this format might enhance your worship experience even more, please contact the church office because we do want you to fully experience time with God during this time. May God bless you all. Today is the day the Lord has made for us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Holy God, we do ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we are embarking on a journey through Scripture with a focus on the Holy Spirit. This journey will take us up to Christ the King Sunday, then we will break for Advent and Christmas and return again in January. God willing, this phase will continue until Palm Sunday. And as you may know, this is part of my Doctor of Ministry project. It includes preaching God's Word and through daily devotional studies, offering ways to engage God more intentionally through prayer, Bible reading, meditation, journaling, and other activities. My prayer is, is that together we will discover anew God's kingdom and God's loving presence through the Holy Spirit in our ordinary lives, while also increasing our awareness of the Holy Spirit's presence in Scripture. And I also hope to offer opportunities for us to share our faith stories or our glimpses of God in our midst with others. I know that there is much mystery surrounding the Holy Spirit. It has not helped that for centuries he was known as the Holy Ghost, or that certain faith traditions have focused on specific aspects of the Spirit's gifts, and not as much on the Spirit's involvement in our everyday lives. Be that as it may, there are some things that we can't know about the third person of the Trinity. He has been called the Spirit of Christ, the Comforter, the Healer, the Advocate. Jesus called him the Counselor, and shortly before his death, he told his disciples that he would send the Spirit to them, and that they could trust the Spirit to guide them, to speak Jesus' words to them, and to bring glory to Jesus. One way of thinking about the Spirit might be to say that He is God's active, creative, and prophetic presence within us and around us. He is God's gift to us, given at our baptisms, and He is the one who gives us good gifts. Gifts of wisdom and understanding, gifts of counsel and power, gifts of knowledge and reverence for God. In Galatians, the Spirit is the one who gives us what the Apostle Paul has called the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In the Old Testament, we read about the Holy Spirit coming and going, filling prophets, kings, and others with his presence, according to God's plan. But it was sporadic, often happening through dreams, visions, songs, and prophetic promises. However, in the New Testament, from Pentecost on, the Spirit was, and continues to be, given to all who believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. You may remember that the Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus at his baptism, in tongues of fire and various languages on the disciples at Pentecost, and in various other ways, many of them not quite so dramatic, 
on believers down through the ages. A couple of years ago, I read an article that lamented the fact that the Holy Spirit was the most overlooked and forgotten presence in the Advent and Christmas stories. It made me start looking at how little time I had devoted to preaching about the Spirit's place in our everyday Christian life. And I was convicted as a preacher and as your pastor. It seemed to follow that if I was not preaching or teaching the scriptures about the Holy Spirit, a significant member of the Trinity was being neglected. How could it not affect our spiritual formation? Thus, I am hoping with God's help to remedy that in the weeks to come. Now, I realize that there may be concern because the Spirit is, as Jesus told Nicodemus, like the wind. In other words, the Spirit will do what the Spirit wants to do when the Spirit wants to do it, to bring glory to Jesus and to lead us into deeper relationship with God. So in some ways, we are embarking on a spiritual adventure, not fully knowing where God will be taking us. But we can be certain it's for the best possible outcome in our daily lives. I can say that with full confidence because it is what God desires for each one of us. But you don't need to take my word for it. Let's listen to God's word for us. Our first text is from an Old Testament prophet who will set the stage for us, so to speak. The scripture from Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28, comes from a longer promise of God to his people. I encourage you to read it on your own in the days to come. To set the stage, we find the Israelites, sadly, have been unable to keep their covenant promises to love and serve God alone. God needed to discipline their wickedness, so he removed the people from the promised land for a season and allowed them to be taken into Babylonian captivity. In this text, we hear God lovingly proclaim what he will give them and who he will give them so that they can be faithful to him in the future. In spite of their disobedience for generations, God still wants them back. They are still his beloved children. Listen to his promise and his words of encouragement. by God to his people. Forgiveness, a fresh start, an intimate divine human relationship, and the gift of his spirit. The people needed all that God promised if they were going to fulfill their calling as God's chosen people, as his beloved sons and daughters. You see, the Israelites knew from past experience that their own willpower, their own determination, were not enough to keep them faithful to God. Not that God expected them to do it on their own strength, mind you. 
He was always wanting a loving relationship with his people, to the point that he was willing to give of himself to be their king. But they had consistently refused, even to the point of worshiping other gods, and thus their current exile. But God is now ready to move forward, and so he promises to do for the people what they cannot do for themselves. You see, then, as now, God always desires to give us what or who we need in order to do what he requires. His spirit enables our spirits to do his will, and he's been doing that for thousands of generations. He also gives his beloved people new hearts, and renewed desire to know and to love him more deeply, more passionately. As one writer put it, only a heart transplant could achieve obedience to God's will, and only God can bestow sufficient inner resources. God's own goodness prompts God to be so good, so good to us, giving us his very self so that we can love and obey him. So now we fast forward some 600 years to hear the good news from a letter to the church in Ephesus. And this is post Pentecost. In this letter, Paul, who is writing from prison, encourages his readers by reminding them of their place in God's plan and purpose. Listen to Ephesians 1, verses 13 to 23. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the almighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Randy and I go on vacation, I often let him plan it and make the reservations. I have a say, of course, but usually I trust him to come up with a trip that we both enjoy. The only problem is I rarely do my research about where we are going. Our recent trip is a case in point. I knew we were going to Indiana Beach and to Lake Michigan. So what was there to do? I didn't know. What special places of interest were nearby? Didn't know. What might I expect? Didn't know. And it wasn't that I didn't care. I just couldn't find the time to look at the maps, to read the brochures, or skim the online travel sites. Did I have a great time? Yes. But in the back of my mind, there were times that I wished that I had been better informed before I left. That way, I've been able to anticipate and even get excited about where we were going and what we'd be doing. And I would have been able to more fully engage in our activities because I would know more about the places and the people that we would see. It felt like, in some ways, that I was just getting by when there could have been so much more to my vacation experience. And it caused me to wonder if this is how the Christian faith is often experienced in 2020. Yes, we remember stories or Bible verses from childhood. Yes, we listen to the weekly sermon if we have time. And yes, we pray our prayers. 
believing that is enough to get us by in our daily life. After all, doesn't it seem that these days especially, ordinary life has a way of getting in the way of our spiritual lives? Even though the resources are at hand, instruction is immediately available anytime that we desire it, and a deeper relationship with God is always passionately being offered. Even though, but many of us are just getting by. Why is that? We cannot place the blame on God. As one saint from the past marveled, God's slightest touch could utterly annihilate us. Yet his only desire is to embrace us with a love that knows no limits at all. God's only desire is to embrace us with a love that knows no limits. Who doesn't want that? And yet, how well do we know that God? How much do we want to know that God? But maybe you're unsure about how to go about it. It can seem near impossible to relate, to have a relationship with an unseen God. I imagine that was one of the concerns of the believers in Ephesus. Like many, the people to whom Paul was writing were lacking in their knowledge about God and their faith. As a result, they were imperfect in their conduct and not always steadfast in their faith. They had their struggles, they had their doubts, they had their failures, they sinned. God knew that, and so did Paul. But that was not to be the end of their story. Just like the Israelites were offered more, so too are the Ephesians offered more, and so too are we. So in his letter, Paul shares his joy that these men and women had first put their faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result that they had put their faith in Jesus, Paul knew that God was at work in their lives. There was still more that they needed to know, yes. There was still more that they needed to experience, yes. There was still more that they needed to share with each other, yes. But they have been given the helper, the counselor, the spirit of Christ, who wanted to provide what they needed. The same spirit God promised the Israelites, he was giving to these Gentile believers generations later. The same new heart, the same promise that they would become new creations in relationship to God. In fact, Paul says these believers have been given a seal, a mark, a designation, if you will, of God's ownership. We are God's adopted sons and daughters, and we have a seal, the Holy Spirit himself, as a proof of this relationship. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee that we belong to God, both now and forever, and he is at work in our lives. He's in, at work in the world as well. Whether we understand it or not, whether we see it or not, whether we acknowledge him or not, and if we want to understand him better, if we want to witness his work in our lives and in the world, if we want to share this good news with others, all we have to do is ask. Ask and it shall be given, Jesus says. Seek and you will find, Jesus says. Knock and the door will be open, Jesus says. And a way to start the seeking, the asking, the knocking, is to pray in the way that Paul prays for his beloved friends because he wants his brothers and sisters in faith to live lives that are more than just getting by. As we know, prayer is talking to God about everything. Prayer is asking God for what we need and thanking him for what he provides. Prayer is bringing our loved ones into God's presence to receive God's grace, God's love, and God's healing. Paul is praying that the Holy Spirit will show the believers how to live the life that God is calling them to live. And it's a prayer that we can pray for ourselves and for those we love. Why would we want to pray this prayer? So that we might have a deeper understanding of God. So that we might have a richer, fuller relationship with God. So that we might have more than just a superficial acquaintance a just getting by relationship with the living God. And it can only happen 
through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What God desires, the Holy Spirit provides when we ask. One translation paraphrases this prayer. I ask God to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally, your eyes focused and clear, so that you can see exactly what it is he is calling you to do. Grasp the immensity of his glorious way of life he has for Christians. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Endless energy, boundless strength. Do we want to grasp the immensity of the glorious way of life that God wants for us? Do we want to experience the utter extravagance of his loving work in us and through us? Then let's start praying for it. Let's start praying others will also experience it. And then let's share it with others. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we do ask for your spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. We ask that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we will know the hope to which you have called us, both now and into eternity. Help us to know, to experience the incomparably great power for us who believe. It's the same power that you exerted when you raised Christ from the dead and seated him at your right hand. We do want to live the lives you are calling us to live. We do want to be embraced by you and to experience the utter extravagance of your loving work in us and through, this, through us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord and Savior. Amen.